You've heard a lot of amazing, inspiring, personal stories so far today. This is something entirely different. <laughs> so what I want to talk about, I, I'm calling the puzzle of the Ashkenazic bottleneck. Scientists have wondered for years now, decades now, why it is that Ashkenazic Jews seem to, to have a much higher prevalence of some terrible genetic diseases that are almost unexplainable in their, their concentration. So at first people thought maybe that had to do with the marriage of cousins, you know, just too much inbreeding. But the math of genetics doesn't support that. You wouldn't get this degree of concentration of those diseases in that manner. It, it just, it, the puzzle just sort of didn't come together that way. So in 2013 or 2012, uh, a geneticist named Shay Carmi published a piece that sort of blew the whole thing wide open. And what he said is something that is pretty amazing, and I think he proved it pretty well, and that is that the root population, the, the, the breeding stock that led to today's roughly 10 million Ashkenazic Jews was only about 300 and something, 330, 40, 50 people in the 14th century. And that's a pretty amazing small number. Now, now that's not the census because that's the number of breeding individuals in what's called the effective population. The census would have been, I don't know, maybe 2,000, 3,000, something like that. But it's still a, a tiny number. So, puzzle solved, right? I mean, that's why you get these, the, these incredible similarities. What Carmi showed is that you could string together a million strands of DNA from Ashkenazic Jews and find the same thing. And that wouldn't happen unless they were essentially cousins, unless they came from a very small and fairly recent breeding stock. It doesn't happen in any other population or just about any. There, there are some isolated populations where it does, but, but not many. Um, and so we know that there was this, this very strange what I think is best called the bottleneck. And the bottleneck occurred because in the Roman Empire, it was estimated that there were probably about six million Jews. Today, there's about 10 million Ashkenazic Jews, and that's after the Holocaust. So you had a big population before, a big population after, but a tiny population in the 14th century. So that explains it all, right? I mean, that's why you have this concentration of these diseases. That's why Ashkenazic Jews have millions of strands of DNA in common. And incidentally, that's something that couldn't have been known until DNA sequencing became widely available. But now it is. So now you can check this stuff. So what's going on here? Well, it all made sense, and the jigsaw puzzle comes together, right? No, wrong. It doesn't come together because if there were six million Jews in the Roman Empire and it somehow got down to a couple of thousand or 350 breeding individuals, something happened in between. But you go to the history books, because I'm only an amateur geneticist and even more so an amateur historian, but you go to the history books and you find a completely different story that does not support the bottleneck. What you hear is that, yeah, there were lots of Jews, probably millions in the Roman Empire. Throughout the Dark Ages, population goes down and comes back up again. There should have still been millions of Jews. And the usual story is that as intolerance rose around 1,000, you know, the, the beginning of the new millennium, um, as intolerance rose, those Jews were pushed out of Western Europe, and they went through Germany to Poland. And so you get this vast movement of Jews from Western Europe to Poland. Presumably you get millions of Jews uh, living in Poland, and those are the ancestors of today's Ashkenazic Jews. The problem with that is there apparently never was a mass 
movement to Poland? And if there was, how did those millions of people get turned into just a couple of thousand? How did the population get reduced? 99%. Well, nothing happened in Poland that could have explained that. The Poles were actually pretty nice to the arriving Jews. There was a uh, Prince Boleslas who published an edict that Jews had to be protected. Uh, Poland was a pretty good place. So the story just doesn't hang together. Somehow, 99 point something percent of the population disappeared. And so that's the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle, and that's what really kindled my interest. So in order to believe it, you go back to all those history books, and you've got to convince yourself that the history is wrong. It's not a little wrong. It's a lot wrong. But that shouldn't be so surprising, because history is not always right. It's affected enormously by winner's bias. The winners write the history. The people who are killed don't. It's also influenced by denial. That is, people don't like to write history about awful things that they did. And so you don't see that in the history. And then finally, the history is especially wrong when you're talking about an illiterate period. And this period is totally illiterate, you know, around 1,000. The only people that knew how to read or write were priests because it was almost entirely forbidden to learn how to read or write at that time. And so you're talking about an illiterate populace doing something ugly and, and then winning and wiping out the victims. And so what was that? Almost certainly it is some kind of mass slaughter. That's my view. Now, I asked a lot of historians in the United States, in Israel, I asked a lot of geneticists their views, and nobody liked this idea of mass slaughter. It's not a very nice idea. I told you this wasn't an inspiring personal story. <laughs> um, so. Nobody liked this idea at all. And so I was given these three theories. One, well, the millions of Roman Empire Jews converted to Christianity. Or two, they were persecuted in ancient Rome and that's why they, were, they disappeared. They, they were wiped out by the ancient Romans. Or three, they just didn't go to Poland. They went somewhere else. Well. I got these theories from really, really smart people who do this stuff for a living. Historians, geneticists, you know, people at the Nobel Prize level. But nobody would really thought about it carefully. And as I talked to each one of them, in general, they all agreed that those theories are wrong. So let's take them one by one very quickly. Conversion. So yeah, the first century, there was a lot of conversion. I mean, you know that. That's where Christianity came from. And so Jews converted to Christianity in the first century. Jews in Spain converted in the 15th century. But those are not Ashkenazic Jews. Those are Sephardic Jews, different population. Popu the population didn't convert that became the root of the Ashkenazic population. They couldn't have. The Catholic Church took the position that it, literally, that sex between Christians and Jews is prohibited, and even meals with Christians and Jews is prohibited during the, the Middle Ages. The Talmud wasn't any nicer. It called it a profanity for a Jew to marry a Christian. And so it just, it, it didn't happen by conversion. It didn't happen by, by persecution. The Romans had a terrible time with the Jews in the first century. You probably all know about that. That led to Masada. But after that, they got along just fine. The Romans were a particularly tolerant lot if you didn't give them any trouble. Christianity became a forbidden religion. Judaism never did. And so it wasn't persecution. All those pictures, you know, this, this is somebody with the lions in the Colosseum. Those were not persecuted Jews. They got along just fine in the Roman Empire. And through the Dark Ages, there's no evidence that Jews were treated particularly badly. So you, you, you really do not explain it that way. So that leaves drift away, which is the theory I heard most. That's also like way wrong, because if there were drift away to somewhere other than Poland, it would leave traces. It would leave a linguistic tradition. It would leave uh, the genetic markers. 
it, it would leave an oral tradition somewhere, well, but there's no such place. I mean, the, the, the Ashkenazic population was in Poland. And so Drift Away is wrong as well. And that unfortunately leaves as the better and only explanation that they were killed in mass violence. And does that seem unlikely? Well, it seemed unlikely to me. It seemed unlikely to the people I bounced it off until you think about it. And then it's not so unlikely. We know that tolerance was very low in this period. The period of the Crusades was a period in which people were mobilizing to go kill people who didn't believe. And who were they mobilizing? They were mobilizing vast armies of illiterate people who would go off to fight non-believers. You probably read the Robin Hood stories when you were young and think that Richard the Lionhearted was some great guy. Well, Richard the Lionhearted, when he was coronated, had the Jews who came to his coronation stripped and flogged and then presided over mass killings of Jews throughout England at that time. The kings of France were just as bad, and it is acknowledged historically that they were pushed out of those countries. Now, that's where you get to the wrong story about they all made it to Poland, they didn't. Some of them did get to Germany, and Germany wasn't any nicer. The Teutonic Knights were so anti-Semitic that they actually published something called the Order of Non-Toleration of Jews that said it was okay to kill them. And so, you know, yes, it's believable that there was mass slaughter during this period. There almost certainly was. The Crusades were a very, very bad, intolerant period with people, you know, on, on horseback, the people we would call today jihadists who were, were out to purify the, the world for Christianity. And it was, it, it was an ugly time. Now, 14th century comes along, the Crusade spirit is waning, and what comes is the Black Plague. And the Black Plague uh, was, was not bigoted, it killed a third of everybody. And so the Jewish population and the Christian population were cut enormously during the Black Plague, roughly by a third. But what happened then is that the Christian villagers, now these are not crusaders, these are villagers all over, all over Europe, thought the Jews had poisoned the wells. And that became a very common thing. First, there were the blood libels, the Jews were kidnapping Christian babies to make matzo or to, per, to, to, to use in some, their blood in, in, in some, some rituals. And then this idea, that they were poisoning the wells and that's what caused the Black Plague. Well, we can't prove that there were enough slaughters to have killed millions because the record is almost absent. But as I say, it is believable, and where the record exists, it is because from time to time, the Vatican looked at these slaughters, they were literate, and they told them to stop. And so we know that the whole Jewish population of Rouen and France was, was murdered. We know that the first shepherd's crusade never got out of, of Europe and instead massacred the Jews, and the Vatican asked them to stop. So we, we know a little about it from Vatican records, but what would you expect from illiterate warriors? You, you're not going to get real history. You're not going to get history from townspeople who don't feel they have any duty to be chroniclers, and because they're illiterate, they don't really have any ability. The only place it could have been recorded is the Vatican, and there's a little bit there that does support it, but they weren't proud of it, and you can see why. So. That, that leads me to say, I think we know the answer. It's just a particularly ugly answer, and nobody really wants to face it, but I think you have to. And it's inevitable, as careful as you have to be about this, to say, let's compare to the Holocaust in the 20th century. So the 20th century Holocaust that occurred around World War II is, is different in this sense. It was very efficient, it was very fast, it was very well organized. This one wasn't. This one occurred probably over 200 years, and it wasn't organized, and nobody really ordered it. It just happened because that was the spirit of these 
particularly awful times. And so the, the two are not the same, but in some sense they produce the same result. And in fact, the 20th century Holocaust was successful for the genocide heirs in the sense that they managed to kill roughly two thirds of all of the Jews in Western Europe. But this one killed 99%. So it was a lot less organized, but it was more effective in that awful sense. So what are the lessons? And that, that's where I'll conclude. Um, the, the, the lessons are first that History can be wrong, as I mentioned earlier, and in fact probably often is when you have these biases. A second lesson is that science today can inform history in a way that it never could before. And I think that's a really important thing for a TED group to think about because we actually have tools that can tell us things about history that are not in the history books. And so that's a second important lesson. But the third one is that this tendency that allowed genocide is part of our species. It's a, it's, it's a part of our species. Thank goodness we don't see all that often. But it's always there lurking. And if we allow bigotry and racial and nationalistic ethnic hatred to enter our politics, and we allow lies to be spread about people that somebody decides they don't like. We are, we are allowing that, that awful part of humanity to come back again. It is, it is the worst part of our innate nature, but we have to understand that it's there, and denial tempts it to come back. And at that, I'll thank you. Thank